For centuries, people have worked the wild and unpredictable Yorkshire coastline. It's a way of life that has all but disappeared, but the incredible artwork that records the fishing industry at its peak still survives. My name's Ace Batty, and this magnificent coastline has been my home for more than 20 years. I'm an actor, but I'm never happier than when I'm at sea. And having been a lifeboatman for nearly 10 years, I know this coastline intimately. In the 19th and early 20th century, if you lived on the coast, you depended on the sea for your livelihood. The work was physically demanding and dangerous. This is a story of those coastal communities told through art. From work by a rebel photographer to art made from the spoils of the catch and by women on the shore, these pieces give us a glimpse of the lives of fishing communities. Our voyage starts in my hometown of Whitby. Our first image will show what life in my neighbourhood would have been like at the height of the fishing industry. Hello, Mike. Hi, Ace. Nice to meet you. Thank you for inviting me to your lovely gallery. You're welcome. I'd like to show you this photograph by Frank Meadows Sutcliffe. Frank Meadow Sutcliffe's Whitby Fisherman by the Harbour Rail transports me to a different time, to when Whitby was a bustling port. Frank Meadow Sutcliffe was one of the most famous photographers alive in his day. And it's beautifully in focus. And also, the background is out of focus, which is what photographers try and do nowadays. And it's one of the most iconic photographs of Sutcliffe, really, is that. Mike Shaw is a Frank Meadow Sutcliffe enthusiast and runs the Sutcliffe Gallery. He was actually a portrait photographer by trade, but he had this passion to photograph everyday working people, to just express himself artistically. Frank Meadow Sutcliffe was born in Yorkshire in 1853, just 14 years after the advent of photography. He embraced this new technology, pioneering it as an art form. Not many people necessarily realise the fact that all the ones with people in he had to actually get them to stay still for a few seconds, which to actually get a natural looking photograph from that is very but difficult. But they look so animated. I know. That was one of his many skills. He took a lot of photos of fishing women as well. Fishing women, girls, yeah. boys, the, the whole gamut really of what Whitby's working fraternity was about. So he must have known the community quite well. These guys here, they wouldn't mess about. No. If they didn't want their photograph taken, they'd have told him to have got lost. I've worked with a few fishermen, yeah. Looks like it's got some real characters in it. Yeah. Do we know who any of them were? So this big chap here is Henry Freeman, and he was a real hero in his day. And in 1861, there was some really rough seas off Whitby. This lifeboat went out with, with Henry Freeman, and he was thrown this new invention, a life jacket. There was a crew of 13, and 12 of them perished. The only survivor was Henry Freeman, because he was the only one wearing this new invention. Thanks to Sutcliffe's passion to get out of his studio with his camera, we can see how much Whitby has changed. How was he considered at the time? By the local people, he was well respected, but by the likes of the Royal Photographic Society, his work was so ahead of its time almost for them that, that he didn't really get anywhere. This was because Sutcliffe was more concerned with capturing the world he saw than with photographic convention. These are really special. These are Sutcliffe's original glass plates. We may look at them and think it's old fashioned technology, but they're in fact far more detailed than your digital cameras of today. In the harbour scene, I can pick out almost every single rope. The detail's amazing. You can look at that and think that it's romantic and you get this feeling of the sea and living a life that's sort of simple, but the actual reality of it is far different. She'd have to bait all those hooks. She'd probably cut her hands to ribbons. The reality 
and the romanticism are the two different things. And you're sort of looking up and over that way. I've invited a photographer and a group of locals to help me understand how Sutcliffe captured such realism. It was during the winter on days like this that he could do what he loved, taking photographs of the real people of Whitby. Sutcliffe's camera was a very simple device, but the process of producing a photograph was complex. He'd have to persuade his subjects to pose, get them into position, and then to hold for two to three seconds. He was a chemist, and in his early days, he took out his darkroom to process his glass negatives. And recreating the photograph makes you appreciate his life's work. At the turn of the century, life along the North Yorkshire coast was very harsh. Which makes it all the more surprising that a group of celebrated artists would choose it as their home. From the 1880s, for almost three decades, nearly 30 artists made the Yorkshire coast their focal point. They became known as the Stades Group. Many of them were already accomplished artists, but this talented group would go on to become world-renowned. This is a watercolour by Dame Laura Knight, painted around 1898. This intimate picture of a fisherman hard at work gives us a detailed and realistic view of his daily routine. Laura Knight is one of the key members of the Stades group. Her atmospheric paintings still strike a chord today. And this painting really resonates with me because it's off the Beck in Stades, where I lived for many years. And there's lots of interesting detail in the painting, like the initials on what I think are fishing boys. Also, the fisherman's hat. I'm intrigued to find out more. To help me understand what life might have been like for our fishermen, I'm heading out to sea from Stades with my old mate, John Cole, who's from a long line of fishermen here. Stades was once among the major fishing ports along the northeast coast, but this morning, we're the only fishing boat leaving the harbour. Are you going for that flag over yeah, there? Yeah, that's right there. Double flags on the out end. Yeah. Single flags on the in-end. Right. We're travelling three miles offshore to check the pots for lobsters and crabs. I just look like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> the boats have changed since the 1800s, but using the hand-knitted pots and bringing in the catch in all weathers remains the same. Oh, man. I need to get back to a gym. Come with us every day, then. <laughs> With our haul in, we head back to the harbour and out of the choppy seas. So, John, when did you start fishing? I started when I was about 16 years old, when I left school. I'm assuming you learned from your dad. Oh, yes, my dad and my uncles. So how far back did the coals go? My sister traced our family back to stairs in the early 1600s. So for 500 years, it's you're been called... that have fished out of stairs. Yes. And when was the heyday of fishing? In 1880, there was 300 men and boys going from the village. 300? 300 men and boys. There was 40, 50, 60 cobbles in, in, in the winter fishing out of this village then. The wooden boats that yeah, were... Yeah, the traditional Yorkshire cobble was a workhorse of the fishing industry. And your family would have been fishing? Yeah, 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 they'll be among them. God, it's changed, hasn't it? Good job in there. Oh, so we're going to the old slip, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. And with John's knowledge of fishing in states, he's going to show me the spot where Laura Knight painted our picture. We're about in the same position. So you've got the steps going up into the cottage 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So where would Laura be, just behind us? Just round here. Of course, it's, everything's changed. A few yeah, more yeah. cobbles then there is now. Oh, there was some cobbles then. And what are these? The boys, what they would put under the herring nets. They used to call them leathers. And the initials? I fancy this is one of the Verrill family. A Verrill name was synonymous with stays, oh, yes. wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a real old stays name. Right? And yeah. coming back to the fisherman, I need to know about his hat. <laughs> well, his hat, known locally, is a hairy hat. A hairy hat? Hairy hat. And of course, no doubt, this one is most likely come from Iceland. So, a Scandinavian influence? Yes, definitely. And to this day, there still is with some of the words of the fishing gear. And of course, you've got the white, white means bay in Scandinavian. And states itself means? landing place but they always said about the stairs fishermen that could con converse with the Norwegian fishermen so people think that Stades was very isolated, especially before the railways came in 1880. But it was actually really connected to the world. It was really cosmopolitan. There was a lot of outside influence. Yes, definitely. The Stades group painted outside, recording life as it happened. <laughs> nice to meet you. Rosamond Jordan is an arts dealer and leading specialist in the Stades group of painters. I just want to say a really big thank you for bringing the painting down and putting it in possibly the position it was originally painted in. This painting has been recently acquired by Rosamond and is by Stades Group member James William Booth. Could you tell us some of the detail? I'm assuming these might be fish? They are. Actually, the further you get away, the more it comes into focus with Impressionism. But those are fish laid out on the harbour side. I would guess it's probably the end of a fish market because there aren't many left there. Influenced by French Impressionism, the States group artists painted quickly to capture light. But they also wanted to capture social realism. Why did the artists come here? The light continually changes and their Impressionist influences made them want to paint changing light. But even more than that, I think it was the people. It was such a sort of closed community at that time. But once they were accepted into the community, the artists could paint their everyday activities. And it's a perfect day to show it off? It is, it just could not be better. Quite often we get pictures of the sea showing it bright blue and people say, oh, that must be wrong. But that. we've got proof We've got now. absolute proof. Huddled around the harbour, the village of Stades, with its bunched up houses separated by narrow cobbled streets, has changed little since the artists painted here. So where are you taking us? Here what is now Fisherman's Cottage. This is where three of the artists actually lived with a Fisher family, cheek by jowl, in a house like this. So they were not just part of the family, through that they extended into being part of the actual community, knowing what hard lives the people who lived here had and being able to express that in their work. Gosh, it must have been really crammed, three artists and a Fisher family. It must have been quite incredible. Fishing was a way of life and involved the whole community. So, Roz, you've picked another fantastic painting. And who painted it? Robert Joblin, a Newcastle castle artist who used to paint stades over and over. And why did you pick this particular painting? I think it shows how involved the whole village was in the fishing industry. Not just the men, but the women as well. Here they are hauling in a boat and they just never stopped. They would go miles along the shore looking for shellfish to bait long lines. And it was such an intense way of life. And whilst the artists painted in the open, it was the fishermen who had to row out in the bitter easterly winds, knowing that if the weather turned, their wooden cobbles were vulnerable to the rough seas. In her autobiography, Laura Knight tells of the harrowing story of how one night, the cobble of the family she lived with didn't return. The next morning, the wife of the fisherman was crying and roaring when, suddenly by the weight of the wind, the door was banged wide open. On the doorstep stood her husband. What's thou roaring at last, shouted he. On hearing his voice, his wife threw off her apron and turning to look at him, yelled with passion, thou booger, I thought thou was dead. This was their lives. This was their daily lives. 
the danger of the sea was the reality they had to live with. The lives of the fishing community were brilliantly recorded by these artists, but at the same time, someone was recording them. This fascinating treasure trove of photographs shows the state's artists at work. Rod Jewell collects magic lantern slides. Right, this is a brilliant shot of William Gilbert Foster, taken in the probably late 1880s. He is the real founding father of the Stays Group because he was responsible for bringing artists to the area. For the next 30 years, artists would come here, documenting the lives of the coastal communities, working closely together. This is Dame Laura Knight with Frederick Jackson painting in the beck at Staithes. So two members of the Staithes group together. That is just an amazing photo. Such Sorry, history. Okay. Rod's always acquiring old photos and recently discovered this image of an artist working on the coast. This is thought to be Dame Laura Knight painting a rather nice canvas with a cobble on the left. That one's not been seen before and actually seeing the artist at work. That's what makes them so rare, you know, right. you, you often get the face, but to actually see them at work is quite rare. The Stades Group brought world-class art to our coast, but not all art is created by trained artists. It's hard to picture now, but Hull was once at the heart of the British whaling industry. Whalers went to sea for months, even years and all that time at sea gave rise to some really unusual pieces of art. This art is called Scrimshaw, and Hull Maritime Museum is home to an internationally renowned collection. Hi, Ace. Hello, Martha. Martha Cattell knows all about this art, and she's picked out some unique pieces. What is Scrimshaw? So Scrimshaw is the carved bones from whales, dolphins or other cetertians and it's usually made up of their teeth or just their bones um, and it's carved by whalers on board whaling ships during the 19th century. So this is all carved? It's yeah, this is etched into the surface of um, a whale bone and then it's stained with lamp black, ink or oil, anything they would have had on board. This rough and ready art was created by working people, so most Scrimshaw is anonymous, lacking authorship, date or even location. But this Scrimshaw has left us a clue. It oh, says, Homeward Bound Sweet, Lass of Hull. So is this from Hull, this piece? Yeah, this is from Hull. We can obviously tell um, that there was a sense of separation between the whaler and his home. So was this a gift? Yeah, it was very common wow. for whalers to create personal gifts for their yeah. loved ones back home, especially women we found, because there was no women allowed on whale ships. So, Martha, what is it? It's actually called a busk, um, and a busk is the main supporting part of a corset. And obviously this was a main fashionable item within the 19th century for women. So I've actually got something really special to show you. Great. Um, we've got an example here of a 19th century corset and I'm saying special because it's very delicate and we don't usually have it on display but as you can see there's a central element here and this is where the busk would just be slipped into to support. Close to our heart. Indeed. Another fact about corsets is that the whole structure of the corset is actually made of whalebone. Used in many everyday items such as lighting, brushes, jewellery and even shoelaces, the high demand for whale products made Hull extremely prosperous. But the memories etched into the bones show it was a high-risk profession. This is a sperm whale tooth and on this tooth it's particularly interesting. As you can see, a sperm whale hunt, you can just make out three small whale boats attacking three sperm whales. I mean, the image is quite terrifying, really. I mean, they're in small boats throwing harpoons into huge whales, and the artist has captured it beautifully. Whaling was a treacherous job, and many hundreds of lives were lost. But the interesting thing about this tooth is if we turn it over, there's another image on the reverse. 
I don't know whether you can make that out, but we have the very faint image of a woman. Mm -hmm. But it shows the two things that the whaler was thinking about at the time, both the whale hunt, but also potentially his sweetheart at home. So he could turn the tooth in his hand and be reminded each time why he was whaling. just around this corner here. Let's have a look. There were other human costs to whaling as museum curator Robin Diper reveals with the sad story behind these mysterious and slightly gruesome plaster casts of human heads. Oh my word. They're really detailed, aren't they? And she looks like she's in pain. It's because these casts were done when they were alive, so the, it wasn't a pleasant experience because they're having yeah. plaster of Paris smeared over their faces and all of that type of thing, sort of tubes to breathe through. Not very nice. This is Oka Look. She's a 15-year-old Inuit girl. And this is Mamiya Look, who's a 17-year-old boy. And this is Captain John Parker, who's a whaling captain from Hull. The teenage Inuit couple from the Arctic were brought back to Hull by Captain Parker on board his whaler, the True Love. Then he put them on show. What happened is Captain Parker did exhibit right. the mere look and look a look. He toured them around effectively. They went to Leeds and York and, and Manchester and were seen by 12,000 people. You can see in the, the post here is sort of the two Eskimo or Yaks as they called them then because of the, the sound of their language. And they would have been wearing their traditional clothes and demonstrating how things were used. It doesn't sit very comfortably from our modern day view. During his long whaling career, Captain Parker had made many journeys to the Arctic. What he'd seen was, as the, the whaling ships had had more contact with indigenous tribes, they'd become more dependent on trade for metal, for firearms and so on, and, and neglected traditional skills. Right. And as a result, they suffered very much, especially when they couldn't get that trade. Captain Parker thought that the British government should take a paternalistic role in looking after this indigenous population. Which it all sounds quite patronising now, but at the time, Captain Parker wouldn't have questioned the colonialism. What he questioned was the lack of responsibility towards the people who came under that. The tour was supposed to raise awareness of their plight and raise funds for the weapons they would take home. There's quite a sad story to this because on the way home, sadly, Ocalot caught measles and she died before she reached home. So it's sort of quite a tragic tale, really. And what happened to Mamir? Look? He did get home, but then the reports were that the experience spoiled him and he went back quite lazy and rich and didn't really sort of reassimilate into his community very well. Right. It didn't work despite Captain Parker's best intentions. Unlike the paintings and photographs we've seen so far, our next piece of art actually goes to sea. Gansies are the traditional woolen jumpers worn by fishermen. Wow, these Gansies are really, really beautiful. These working garments are tightly knitted, making them warm and windproof. And in the 19th century, they were rarely washed. And it is said that the buildup of muck helped to make them waterproof. And the one I'm wearing is shorter on the sleeves because that's how the fishermen The fishermen would. like to wear them like that so they don't get their cuffs caught in the pots or the ropes. Leslie Berry is a Gansey expert and owns the only place on the East Coast where you can buy one. And it's also becoming a bit of a museum. Would you see them as works of art? I definitely would. Why? Well, they tell a story and they're part of our heritage, which is going to disappear in the end. Small fishing communities who all had their own individual patterns and inside that family patterns as well. This is Robin Hood's Bay, which is just the ropes and sand and shingle. Yeah. That's Scarborough, oh, Whitby. Right. Whitby, I like. It's Hum Humber, <laughs> the Humber one, which is the, a river one. Inspiration for the patterns was taken from their surroundings. If you look at this filey one, mm -hmm. they, they all use symbols of the sea. It's got herring bones there, which a Flamborough one would never have because the herring fishing didn't come as far south as this. It's got diamonds, which are the fish nets. It's got cables, which are the ropes. And it's got ladders there and sand and shingle. Although they are decorative, they also served a sombre purpose. 
There is a theory that if a fisherman is drowned and his body is washed up, you can tell who he was and where he came from by his gansey. Fascinating, but sad at the same time. Mm, humbling, yes, because yeah. it's a hard life. As the fishing industry dwindles, the knowledge of knitting a gansey is in danger of disappearing with it. The patterns were never written down. They were just shown by example. So, Leslie, if these patterns weren't written down, how did you find out about them? Because we knew Nora Woodhouse, who lived in the village, she's a fisherman's wife, and she knitted ganses for us. And when we were asked to, if we could get them for other people, she knitted us all these prototypes. Leslie and Nora recorded these patterns and set about teaching others the craft. Our Lord shall save from wind and wave, we're sailing, sailing home. But despite their attempts, there are still only a few people who are helping to keep the tradition alive. Like Leslie's recruit, Marion. And I'm going to do my small part to help. Marion, did many men knit? Well, we haven't actually got anything to prove it, but I'm sure out of necessity, men probably did. And if you really want to help me, yes. I've got something here that <laughs> probably you could finish for me. OK, let's give it a go. I'm going to pull up my sleeves. I don't know why, but I feel that yep. feels right. OK, so we've got four needles here. Mm -hmm. That's your fifth. My fifth. And so we need you to start on this side. You're going to have okay. to hold that as well. OK, I can do this. You can do this. Is that in? Yeah, more or less. Yep. And now you're slipping that stitch off there. Have I done one? Yeah, well yeah. done. <laughs> I've done one. <laughs> Ganseys, Guernseys, or even smocks, as they are called elsewhere on the coast, require skill and patience to make and take even the most proficient knitter 100 hours to complete. There are five needles. Why is that? It's to make a garment without any seams. There is absolutely nothing to sew up right. on this jumper when you're finished. So you make, essentially, a tube. Knitted as one piece, this working jumper can easily be mended. We do get requests for special ganses to be mended, and this is such a one. It's um, Mr Daniel De Lewis's father's gansy, and he requested that it was mended quite recently. That looks brand new, though, you can't tell. It does. They did just Mr. get better did, with age. Did Mr Lewis wear it himself? I believe he did. I believe he wore it on his latest film. I think this is why he needed it mending. After featuring in the Oscar-nominated film The Phantom Thread, Daniel Day-Lewis donated his father's Gansey to Leslie's Growing Museum. And what pattern did he choose? Well, this is a stairs one. And what about this one that I'm helping with? Well, that was supposed to be about the arms of a finely Gansey, but I think I should give you maybe a bit more of a hand. Ganseys are part of the fabric of coastal life. I mean, wearing one, you feel really connected to a thread that goes back through generations of fishing families. I'm so pleased that this wonderful art form is still being created and worn today. He's a pilot, we're sailing home. There's not much left of the fishing industry that once dominated the Yorkshire coast, but its stories and traditions are being kept alive through art. Please.